History as it happens, August 22nd, 2023. Oppenheimer, the missed opportunity. One of the primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. We have made a thing, the most terrible weapon that has altered abruptly and profoundly the nature of the world. We have made a thing that by all the standards of the world we grew up in is an evil thing. Stand boiling cloud surges to a height of 40,000 feet two minutes after zero. Ten minutes in a time where our knowledge and understanding of the world of nature grows wider, broader, and deeper with unparalleled speed and scope, and where the problems of applying this knowledge to man's needs and man's hopes are very new. In the councils of government, we must car- guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The father of the atomic bomb said he never regretted the work he did at Los Alamos. But after the war, he did try to influence the future of U.S. national security policy. Oppenheimer wanted to avoid an arms race. He opposed the H-bomb. He called for candor, not secrecy. Truman, then Eisenhower, mostly ignored him as the U.S. and Soviet Union waged Cold War. Was a different outcome possible? That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine how the Cold War, in a sense, would not have occurred by 1945, mostly because of the, um, the Soviet Union, the leadership of Joseph Stalin. It, it's hard to imagine Stalin agreeing to the international control of atomic energy, for example, which, of course, is what Robert Oppenheimer was promoting and hoping for desperately, that until Stalin's death in March of 1953, I think things were pretty much set in lockstep in terms of competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. They may be the most famous words ever spoken by Dwight Eisenhower. His warning delivered in his farewell address, January 17, 1961, about the The military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. Now, Eisenhower offered these words of wisdom after playing a major role building up America's nuclear arsenal to some 20,000 bombs. The Soviet Union had about 2,000 by this time. Both superpowers had the H-bomb. The Cold War was in a deep freeze, exactly the set of circumstances Robert Oppenheimer wanted the world to avoid. From 1945 until he was stripped of his security clearance in 1954, Oppenheimer tried to use his significant influence to steer U.S. policy away from secrecy, away from the arms race, from manufacturing weapons that served one purpose, mass destruction. It will be difficult in the days ahead, difficult and beset with discouragements and frustrations, and it will be very slow, but it will not be impossible. If it is recognized, as I think it should be recognized, that this, for us, in our time, is the fundamental problem of human society, then it will not be impossible. These are very major commitments, nor would I minimize their depth, for they involve holding prior to all else we cherish, all that we would live for and die for, our common bond with all people everywhere, our common responsibility for a world without war, our common confidence that in a world thus united, the things that we cherish, learning and freedom and humanity, will not be lost. It was because Oppenheimer was so influential, so persuasive, that Louis Strauss conspired to ruin his reputation in the early 1950s. Their conflict brilliantly portrayed in Christopher Nolan's blockbuster film, And this is the third and final episode of my series dealing with the historical debates raised by the movie. Here we're going to deal with the question, was the Cold War avoidable? Was the arms race avoidable? And if so, how? 
In their Pulitzer Prize-winning biography, American Prometheus, Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin write that had the recommendations of the Oppenheimer panel been accepted by the Eisenhower administration in 1953, the Cold War might have taken a different, less militarized trajectory. Among the recommendations was the call for candor. The American people should be kept informed, rather than left in a state of ignorance, about their country's massive nuclear arms production. That simply building more weapons than the Russians would not reduce the nuclear peril. Oppenheimer gave a speech on candor, published on June 19, 1953 in Foreign Affairs, and reported on by major newspapers. As Byrd and Sherman write, it sparked a vigorous debate within the administration on what the public should be told about nukes. In Oppie's eyes, candor was necessary because the public needed to be frightened at the prospect of an endless arms race. But rather than candor, Eisenhower offered Adams for Peace, December 8, 1953, at the United Nations. This greatest of destructive forces can be developed into a great boom for the benefit of all mankind. The United States knows that peaceful power from atomic energy is no dream of the future. That capability, already proved, is here, now, today. Who can doubt? If the entire body of the world's scientists and engineers had adequate amounts of fissionable material with which to test and develop their ideas, that this capability would rapidly be transformed into universal, efficient, and economic usage. The Soviets did not respond to Ike's idea, his offer of an international effort to build nuclear power plants for peaceful purposes. Eisenhower would soon embrace a policy of massive retaliation. Rather than spend more on conventional weapons, the U.S. would amass thousands of nukes. Precisely the opposite, write Sherwin and Byrd, of what Oppenheimer hoped for from the new administration. At the height of his influence, the father of the atomic bomb could not stop the H-bomb, nor could he sway Joseph Stalin, even if he had been in a position to try. Today, the U.S. and Russia possess about 90 percent of the world's 12,000-plus nuclear weapons, a legacy of the Cold War that hangs over human existence like a sword of Damocles. Greg Herkin is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of California. He is the author of Brotherhood of the Bomb, The Tangled Lives and Loyalties of Robert Oppenheimer, Ernest Lawrence, and Edward Teller. And he continues to write about these matters and the movie at brotherhoodofthebomb.com. Greg Herkin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. Part three of my Oppenheimer series, and we're going to go to the end of the story that is covered in the movie, and that is the early Cold War years, which the movie uses as a backdrop, right, when it gets into the gray board security hearing dealing with Robert Oppenheimer's security clearance. But before we get into all that history, I thought the movie was tremendous. What did you think of the movie? I agree. I thought it was a great movie. Uh, it gets Lewis Straws exactly right. There are some, you know, I think, somewhat minor historical issues. It takes some liberties, for example, that Oppenheimer did not go to Einstein to do the calculation for atmospheric ignition. He went to Arthur Compton. But uh, Nolan made that choice deliberately so he wouldn't have to introduce people who basically viewers would not know about. Yeah, I've read a number of articles criticizing this or that historical inaccuracy. I find almost all of them to be relatively minor. I mean, as a as a work of history, it isn't a work of history. It's a movie. One negative review in The New Yorker did say it chose to show Oppenheimer's story as a morality tale where he's a martyr and Straws is the villain. I mean, I think they've got a point about Straws. He did deliberately, maliciously destroy Oppenheimer's reputation, maybe even his life, as some people believed. But when it comes to Oppenheimer, did you think the movie showed him in all his complexities? Well, no. Uh, Actually, I think Oppenheimer is a more complex and conflicted individual than Nolan even depicts. That We now know that Oppenheimer was a a member of a closed unit of the professional section of the Communist Party from 1937 to 1942. And that gave him something that he never admitted – and thus gave him something even lied about. So they gave him something, a secret that he had to keep. So in effect, the government had that over him for all those years after 1954. Uh, and I think that explains why Oppenheimer did not take part in the nuclear weapons debate uh, and did not speak out like Andrei Sakharov did. 
Soviet physicist with whom he has been compared, Oppenheimer remained quiet. Yeah, the movie leaves that aspect of his life ambiguous. Uh, you right. See, you right. See well, even actually, I think it denies that he was a member. But <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, good point. One powerful tool at the disposal of historians, as you know, of course, is chronology. So if we're going to get into a discussion about whether the arms race, which Oppenheimer opposed, and the Cold War itself might have been avoided or maybe taken on a less zero-sum existential nature, we might want to get into a bit here when and where, in your view, the Cold War begins. There's no single date or incident, right? So I do have uh, The Cold War here, A World History by Odd Arne Westad. In one of the opening chapters, Westad suggests, well, maybe the Cold War begins in Poland in 1945 because of the Alta Conference. Or maybe it begins in Germany, and then West Germany is created in 1949. Or the Soviet test of an A-bomb that same year, then the H-bomb tests come after that. You get my point. So I don't right, know. Right. Where, where do we begin the beginning of the Cold War. Right. right. Well, I used to tell my students that the Cold War began on December 7th, 1941. Uh, that was the date of the Soviet counteroffensive against the uh, German Wehrmacht in front of Moscow, and also the date, of course, of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So that was the beginning of the end for, for Germany. It was, I think, the, be- the beginning of what would become the great rivalry between two superpowers at the end of the war in 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union. How helpful is it to try to assign degrees of responsibility? I know historians don't like to get into the blame or guilt game, but degrees of responsibility on on each side here. I mean, I think both sides, U.S. and USSR, hold responsibility, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine how the Cold War, in a sense, would not have occurred by 1945, mostly because of the and the Soviet Union, the leadership of Joseph Stalin. It's hard to imagine Stalin agreeing to the international control of atomic energy, for example, which, of course, is what Robert Oppenheimer was promoting and hoping for desperately, that until Stalin's death in March of 1953, I think things were pretty much set in lockstep in terms of competition between the United States and the Soviet Union regarding nuclear weapons. Yeah, we're going to get into that in a moment. The Truman administration does seem like a good place to start. And in the context, too, of domestic American anti-communism, opposition to the spread of communism internationally. It is necessary only to glance at a map to realize that the survival and integrity of the Greek nation are of grave importance in a much wider situation. If Greece should fall under the control of an armed minority, the effect upon its neighbor Turkey would be immediate and serious. Confusion and disorder might well spread throughout the entire Middle East. So after Kennan, he loses his spot at the State Department policy planning staff in 1949. His successor is Paul Nitza, and uh, I think you probably know where I'm going with this. National (laughs) NSC 68, document number 68. And Mm -hmm. when you look at what Nitza writes here, and this becomes U.S. policy, and again, this is two years after the Truman Doctrine speech, uh, aid to Greece and Turkey, but it's really about containing the threat of global communism. When you read the ideology that Nitza pours onto the page. I mean, it's no wonder that we had problems here. I'll just cite a couple of sentences, and then maybe you can put this into context for us here. Nitza's writing, The Soviet design calls for the complete subversion or forcible destruction of the machinery of government and structure of society in the countries of the non-Soviet world and their replacement by an apparatus and structure subservient to and controlled by the Kremlin. Our free society finds itself mortally challenged by the Soviet system. It is quite clear from Soviet theory and practice the Kremlin seeks to bring the free world under its dominion by the methods of the Cold War. Why were U.S. leaders like Nitsa convinced the Soviet Union was trying to dominate the world? Nitsa was basically painting a portrait of a good versus evil. Uh, that this was Athens versus Sparta. Uh, we were Athens, the Soviets were Sparta. There could be no compromise, actually, with the Soviet Union, certainly with someone like Stalin, so that therefore we had to maintain military superiority 
Uh, and for Kennan, it was an ideological struggle. For Nitsa, it was very much a military competition, that we had to maintain superiority over the Soviets at every level. And because the American people were not willing to fight another great war on the ground in Europe, this superiority had to be with our winning weapon, with our nuclear weapons. Nuclear superiority indefinitely to deter the Soviets and ultimately to cause them to back off. But we now know that the Soviet Union was not, did not have a master plan to dominate the world, didn't even have a master plan for Europe after the end of the Second World War, right? I went to the Soviet Union in what, I think, 1988 and saw the, the belly of the beast in person for the first time. And, you know, I thought these are people who couldn't even make the escalators run. So the idea that they're going to conquer the world was ludicrous. Uh, but there was a certain element of truth. The, the ideology, certainly, of communism, Soviet communism, did talk about world conquest. Um, you can't see it. I have a, a poster in, in back here that is dates from 1953. It's a Soviet poster. And it shows a little boy sitting in front of a globe of the world. And the caption is, the whole world will be ours. So this was the, the point of view that was promoted, certainly, by the Soviets. I think the Soviet uh, Russian citizens knew that, well, you know, if we can get a meal on the table, that we're lucky. But the the ideology was one of expansionism. And Kennan, of course, is the one who said that we should contain this. His containment was by example and by diplomacy. Nitz's containment was military. Here we're going to return to Kennan and why he grew so disenchanted with the way uh, the United States was approaching the Cold War, militarization of foreign policy. But the U.S. at the time, in 1945, 46, 47, U.S. leaders understood the Soviet Union was far behind it, right, in many ways. I mean, the Soviet Union was a wreck after World War II. It was, but it still had a large army. And, of course, it had marched into, you know, over Germany and into uh, Western, well, Eastern Europe, I should say, and was very much in control there. So that it seemed to be an expansive force. And I can understand in 1950, uh, especially after the Soviet bomb was tested in August of 1949, and after Soviet spies were found to have spied on the uh, Manhattan Project, that one can imagine, you know, the fear which McCarthy, Joseph McCarthy, fed on that the Russians are coming, the Russians are going to get us, so therefore we have to be uh, vigilant overseas, but also we have to be vigilant at home and root out the communists. Yeah, in terms of propaganda and ideology, you're right. Um, the export of international communism, world revolution, I know historians debate as to when they finally gave up on that, under Brezhnev, maybe even before that. I mean, under Khrushchev, they were already starting to cut back on their military expenditures. In 1946, so I just was reading NHTSA, NSC 68, mm -hmm. That's not until 1949. In 1946, Oppenheimer and like-minded scientists were calling on the Truman administration to pursue international controls on atomic bomb development. What did they mean by that? What Oppenheimer hoped would happen, and this was uh, basically, he was the author of what's called the atchison Lilienthal Report on the International Control of Atomic Weapons, is that we could go to the Soviets and that we and the Soviets would agree to either get rid, well, actually to get rid of nuclear weapons, but certainly for them, not to develop them. This might have had, well, I don't think it really would have had a chance under Joseph Stalin, Stalin as the leader, but the idea was that uh, we could sort of sit down and negotiate this. The problem is that the Oppenheimer report was given to Bernard Baruch to, yes. to act on, and Baruch was a very vain, very wealthy uh, advisor, self-appointed advisor to the president. Uh, Baruch surrounded himself with people who Dean Acheson called the Wall Streeters. These were his advisors on how supposedly to negotiate with the Soviets. And it was clear that the, the International Control of Atomic Energy plan that Oppenheimer developed when it became the Brute plan, was simply a plan to open up the Soviet Union and find out exactly how much uranium they had, how far advanced they were toward maybe making the first their first nuclear weapon. It was, as one, one person said, a bald espionage plot. And the Soviets saw this, that there was never any chance that the Brute plan was going to be accepted by the Soviets, certainly not by Joseph Stalin. Yeah, we need to talk about Soviet intransigence as well. And some of the missteps Stalin made in Germany also, that heightened the tensions between these two erstwhile allies in the war. Well, I, I guess you know, the point is that until March 53, that there was probably no prospect of a <laughs> settlement between us and the Russians regarding nuclear weapons. But 
interestingly enough that, you know, this is actually in, in my book as well, but Penin saw the possibility of uh, negotiating real diplomacy with the Soviets, as did Bolin, who was the American ambassador to the Soviet Union, right after Stalin died. And there was a missed opportunity, I think, here that could have been taken by the Eisenhower administration. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. And, and was not. Pinning down Oppenheimer on some of these issues can be difficult. Uh, For instance, at one point when the H-bomb development is getting underway, he makes an argument against H-bombs because it would be wiser just to build a lot of tactical-sized atomic weapons. And, you know, he had not been against dropping the bomb on Hiroshima, whatever private reservations he had. You know, he did not officially oppose that. He actually had argued against just doing a demonstration explosion to scare the Japanese. He said to use it, you have to actually use it on a city. And then after the war, he does, you know, he does want to see a move toward disarmament rather than an arms race. But uh, he was warned, and I'm reading here from page 430 of the American Prometheus biography by Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin. His old friends on the left, men like Phil Morrison, Bob Serber, and even his own brother had warned him it was a futile gamble to try to get U.S. policy to move in the other direction, even at this early stage in the immediate post-war years. Well, as it turned out, they were right. Oppenheimer tried, and uh, that's why uh, one reason Louis Strauss and William Borden and the H-bomb lobby and the Air Force and the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, went after him, especially Louis Strauss. Strauss and, and Borden said that whenever you opened a door in Washington in those days, Oppenheimer was behind it. Oppenheimer was the head of the panel on disarmament uh, under the Truman administration and uh, and had been the, the chairman of the General Advisory Committee, the scientific committee that advised the Atomic Energy Commission. And, of course, he was the father of the atomic bomb. Yeah. Um, he was well-spoken. He was an international figure. He did have a lot of influence, and that's exactly why Strauss felt that he, he had to be undermined and destroyed. And his friends chided him for being a member of the establishment, but he thought if there was any chance at influencing policy in the way he wanted to see it go— he had to do it from the inside, right? Yeah, and, and actually, frankly, I think Oppenheimer enjoyed that role. I mean, Chevalier one time mentioned that you know, Oppenheimer was talking about George, and, and you know, Chevalier, who was George? Well, George was George Marshall. He was the Secretary of State. Oppenheimer was on first-name basis with these people. Uh, he partied with them, if you will, I mean, socialized with them, I should say. So, yeah, and he, he enjoyed that influence. He was always a man who who wanted to be on stage and really thought of himself on stage and wanted to have a major influence upon world history. Yeah, some of this doesn't come out in the movie maybe as strongly as it might have if Nolan had decided to tell this part of the story, right? I mean, the movie's already three hours long. <laughs> right, right. You There's know. only so much you can do, in, in yeah. three, even in a three-hour movie. Uh, yeah, but the whole focus there is uh, in the movie is uh, upon Oppenheimer's opposition for the hydrogen bomb and also the Chevalier incident. Yeah. Those are important, but actually the story goes on that, that Oppenheimer in 1952, before the bomb was actually, the hydrogen bomb was tested, was promoting an idea called the thermonuclear standstill. And that is that you would go to the Russians and you would say, look, we are not going to test a hydrogen bomb. We will have a moratorium on the test of hydrogen bombs if you agree not to develop them too. Again, I think that probably would have gone nowhere with Stalin, but it was never presented by the American government. Comrade Stalin, you mentioned a date before, March 1953. That's Stalin's death. That is obviously very important in this whole story. January 31st, 1950, Truman announces the H-bomb program. Uh, Oppenheimer had been opposed to this program for the reasons you just stated. I mean, how close did the opponents of the program actually get to stopping it? Well, probably not very, uh, simply because Truman asked the question, well, if we can do it, can the Russians do it? And the answer is obviously yes. And also, you have to remember, as I used to tell my students, the temper of the time, it was just at this time that uh, it was found out that Klaus Fuchs had, uh, was a Soviet agent. He was the scientist, a British scientist who worked uh, at Los Alamos and who was a Soviet spy who had given the secrets of the bomb, even the diagrams, even the blueprints of the Fat Man implosion bomb to the Soviets. He was not the only spy at Los Alamos, but he was arguably the most important. There was another fellow there who wasn't even recruited, Ted Hall, who just shared information. Right. Yeah. Would you say by January? 1950, the Cold War is definitely underway? 
Oh, yeah. 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 Is it I irreversible? Think, yeah, sure. Is it irreversible at this point? It is going to continue until there is some major change, at least probably in leadership. And again, I, I think it, there was really no possibility of a negotiated settlement with the Russians on nuclear weapons prior probably to uh, Stalin's death in 53. But after that, there was a short period of time, I think, where the Soviet leadership had not coalesced, where, uh, yeah. and this is what Bolin and Ken argued, is that we should make an appeal, we should approach them, the new leadership, and see if there might be an agreement to put some limits upon the arms race, which is going to drain the Soviet economy as well as the American economy, yeah, the Ken, Soviet economy much more. Yeah, Kennan was... An anti-communist. He did not like Stalinism, but he did become disenchanted and quite worried about the militarization of U.S. foreign policy. Why didn't he share the fear of the USSR to the point where he thought that you could actually work with these people? Well, Kennan kind of never believed that the, the Russians were going to launch an attack on Western Europe. Uh, he was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was yeah, he was right. Well, he was right. He's vindicated after the fact. The irony is that at the very end, uh Nitza and Kennan pretty much came to agree. Shortly before their, their deaths, they they lived quite a long time and ultimately uh Nitza agreed that, yeah, okay, the Soviets were not really the great fearsome bear that uh, he had thought them to be, or he feared them to be. So in your book, Brotherhood of the Bomb, you write quite a bit about something called uh, Operation Candor. You know, the H bomb program is underway. The US would test one, the Soviets would test one. So there's no stopping it now. The idea is well, if there's candor we shouldn't be holding these secrets from the American people about what we're doing. If their security is so important to them, we should be able to tell them about it. Talk to me a little bit about Operation Candor and why it ultimately did not go anywhere. Well, this, I guess, is, gets to the subject of missed opportunities. The, the hydrogen bomb was, the first hydrogen bomb was exploded on November 1st, 1952. And it turned out to be even more powerful than the scientists had expected. It was over 10 megatons. It dug a, a crater in the ocean floor, it was yeah. set off in the South Pacific, uh, over a mile and a half wide. Shortly after, this is November, this is about November 52. So this is just when Dwight Eisenhower is elected. And Eisenhower is briefed on the results of the Mike test when he's the president-elect, even before he becomes president. And he is visibly, I wouldn't say distraught, but visibly affected by the news of, of this new weapon. So the, he is open to the idea, I think, of trying to put some limits on these weapons. And to get to Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was the head of the so-called panel on disarmament, which was advising the government on what to do about nuclear weapons. And Oppenheimer was hopeful that and had reason to be hopeful that Eisenhower might represent a change in policy, that it might be possible to put some limits on these things. And first, to change the mindset of the American people uh, from what it had been, basically, that you know, the communists are coming to get us. Is that because Eisenhower, I mean, who would question Eisenhower's anti-communist credentials? Did he feel like he actually had the credibility to do something like this without being attacked as, you know, an agent of the Soviet Union? Well, actually, uh, Joseph McCarthy yes. was questioning Eisenhower's credentials. Yeah, again, you have to remember the temper of the yeah. times. This is when McCarthy is at his, by 1950, uh, at his peak of popularity and is, is talking about you know, the, the vast communist conspiracy and its effect here at home as well as overseas. So it was a... Uh, it was a tragic period looking yeah. back at it that there was just an opportunity that Eisenhower might have had yeah. to do to basically Operation Candor. What, what Oppenheimer was, was asking Eisenhower to do is to tell the American people the truth about the arms race, that the Russians now have the bomb as well, that we are in a competition with them. This is the apes on the treadmill kind of thing, that you know we are developing as many bombs as we can. They are developing as many and as the most powerful bombs that they can too, and that uh, this is not going to end well. So therefore, that we should you know begin to think that maybe we should negotiate, we could negotiate with the Russians and not view them as just the boogeyman over there who is coming to get us. But in the end, he doesn't accept the recommendations of the Oppenheimer panel in 1953. Uh, what were some of those recommendations? Uh, you're talking about Operation Candor, about being open about this instead of having it be a secret. I mean, we live today, right? Everything about national security, we take it for granted, is supposed to be a secret. But uh, Oppenheimer also wanted a policy of no first use, a moratorium on testing. I mean, you mentioned some of these things. 
And Oppenheimer went with the emphasis uh, not to be, uh, military emphasis, not to be on building mammoth bombs and for a strategic bombing offensive against the Soviet Union. He wanted the emphasis to be upon air defense in this country against a possible Soviet attack. Uh, he wanted an emphasis upon tactical nuclear weapons, small nuclear weapons, not multi-megaton city-busting bombs like the ones that Teller was then building. And, and and you mentioned no first use as well, which is still, by the way, which has never been adopted as a policy by the United States. I'd like to get your uh, thoughts on the following from page 452 of American Prometheus. If the recommendations of the Oppenheimer panel had been accepted by the Eisenhower administration in 1953, what we've been discussing here, the Cold War might have taken a different, less militarized trajectory. That is, of course, the theme of this episode. Uh, They go on to write, This tantalizing speculation was later advanced by Bundy in his 1982 essay in the New York Review of Books, The Mischance to Stop the H-Bomb. And in the years since the demise of the Soviet Union, Russian archival documents have compelled his historians to rethink basic assumptions about the early Cold War. The enemy archives, as the historian Melvin Leffler has written, demonstrate the Soviets did not have preconceived plans to make Eastern Europe communist, to support the Chinese communists, or to wage war in Korea. Stalin had no master plan for Germany and wished to avoid military conflict with the United States. And they go on to say that, you know, of course, the USSR was a cruel police state under Stalin, but when he dies, his successors, Melenkov and Khrushchev begin a process of de-Stalinization. They had an appreciation, they write, for the inherent dangers of a nuclear arms race. So there may have been an opening here to come to a modus vivendi and not, you know, wind up in 1960 with the U.S. with 20,000 nuclear weapons. I know I just dumped a whole bunch on you there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> we're talking about missed opportunities, yeah. and I and I think you're right that probably in Eisenhower's second term. So we're talking about 1957 or so, that and Khrushchev is firmly in power by this time, that Eisenhower and Khrushchev might have dealt with each other. And, and certainly Eisenhower was open to that. I think ironically, and, I, and that's the point that Mel makes, is that the Russians, that Khrushchev would have been open to it as well. He was rebelling against what they what the Russians call the metal eaters. The metal eaters are the military industrial complex in the Soviet Union. So there might have been some possibility there for a nuclear test ban treaty, for example. But this gets back into American domestic politics. One of the people who were opposing a test ban included Edward Teller. And Teller had this, by this time, had supplanted Oppenheimer as the primary advisor to the scientific advisor to the American government. And Teller in no way wanted there to be a test ban. He wanted to develop bigger and, and bigger and better bombs. Yeah, he was talking uh, about the H bomb in, in 1942, right? In the movie, right? He exa- exactly, yeah. exactly. So, and there was never a bomb that Teller didn't like, it seemed. And there are lots of stories I can tell you about that. Yeah. But in any case, getting back to 1957 or thereabouts, the Eisenhower recognized that there was a possibility, I think, for a test ban treaty. And they even got down to negotiations with the Russians over how many on-site inspections you would have. And that might have that might have worked, except that Teller came up with all kinds of wild schemes for how the Russians could cheat on a test ban treaty. They could test nuclear weapons on the far side of the moon. They could test oh. them in deep uh, underground salt caverns, for example, and we'd not be able to tell that they had done that. You know, these were scientific nonsense, ultimately. But the dark they side of the important. moon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's without, insane. Yeah, no one would that. try something like that. <laughs> well, 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 we were not launching rockets to the moon at that time either. So yeah. I got to say, I did not know a lot about the Manhattan Project, at least not to this extent, until I started to read American Prometheus and see the movie. Then I finally realized that's the same teller who advised Reagan to pursue SDI. Another, sure. you know, crazy idea. But. Yeah. Well, and this gets back to Oppenheimer, is that teller believed that what had happened to Oppenheimer had basically scared American scientists and did not not agreeing to work on defense projects like the X-ray laser being developed at Livermore, and which was the heart, as far as Teller was concerned, was the heart of SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. So he believed that you know, basically the problems that he was having recruiting scientists at Los Alamos and Livermore to work on the X-ray laser 
went back to the Oppenheimer hearings, and uh, which is ironic because Teller is the one who basically stuck the knife in the back of Oppenheimer at those hearings yes, and twisted did. the blade, as one of the scientists told me. Uh, just a couple of other uh, notes here. Khrushchev renewed arms control talks at the West in 1955, and he had cut Soviet defense spending by the end of the 1950s. But the United States is going in the opposite direction. I mentioned before 20,000 nuclear warheads by the end of the Eisenhower administration. Then, of course, he goes on, I guess it probably was television at that point, to warn about the military-industrial complex. My point here is Oppenheimer you know, wasn't a saint. He was not flawless. You know, maybe you can say he was a martyr uh, based on, you know, how he's depicted in the movie. I don't know if he ever referred to himself that way. But he was right about some important things. And that was, by the time we have 20,000 missiles, it's not going to make much of a difference versus the Soviet Union's 2,000 missiles. Yeah. Uh, actually, he said that in his speech at oh. the, uh, in 1953 and uh, before the Council of Foreign Relations. And that became his foreign affairs article. He said exactly that. That's um, probably where I and, got it from. It, <laughs> yeah, and, and it will make no difference. It, that's why he was talking about Andor, that he wanted Eisenhower to go out and to let the American people know that you know, this arms race is going to be unlimited, basically, uh, or potentially. Was that 1953 Sorry. essay and speech, that ticked a lot of people off, didn't it? That and the fact that the, the panel on disarmament was talking about uh, stopping the test of the American hydrogen bomb back in November of 52, basically you know, pissed off is probably uh, not, yeah. not even you – know, petrified people like Straws and the Air Force and uh, what became known as the H-bomb lobby, certainly Straws in particular. So that it was a realization that, that Oppenheimer had to be stopped. And here an important – talk about chronology. An important thing is Eisenhower – even before Eisenhower appoints Straws the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, which is in July 53, I believe. Before that, he appoints him, Straws, the special assistant on nuclear weapons. And so Straws is there – is the viper in the nest of the Eisenhower administration at the very beginning. You can read this in my book. Literally, Oppenheimer was going to meet with uh, with Eisenhower and sort of tell him about Candor and you know suggest some some way forward. And Straws prevented that meeting. Straws headed off Oppenheimer every opportunity he had to make sure that Oppenheimer wouldn't influence Eisenhower because he could be a very persuasive guy. As we he know. could, yeah, you know, the father of the atomic bomb. Yeah. Right. I think he probably wanted to put that child up for adoption after a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was very comfortable with that. Of course, yeah. you know, Edward Teller would become famously known as the father of the hydrogen bomb. And I don't think that Teller actually minded that designation. I don't know if it's possible to separate the Cold War from the arms race, but it does sound like an arms race was probably more avoidable than a Cold War, uh, based on what we've been discussing here. What are your final thoughts on this? Were there other possibilities? Was a different future possible? I mean, I would say yes, there are always different outcomes yes. possible, but how realistic are they? Well, yeah, you know, there there was a moratorium on the test, atmospheric test of nuclear weapons in 1958, so that, you know, measures were achieved. Unfortunately, you know, the moratorium was violated first by the Soviets uh, because the, the metal eaters, the Soviet defense uh, military industrial complex, realized it was behind the United States in terms of the development of certain weapons, yeah. nuclear weapons. So therefore, they urged and pretty much strong-armed Khrushchev into breaking the moratorium on nuclear testing. Uh, but that would, there was another missed opportunity that might have uh, succeeded. And of course, the Russians test the world's most powerful hydrogen bomb, the so-called Tsar bomb. It was 60 megatons, nice. kind of to make a point that, uh, you know, we are, we're still here and we're still a threat. Yeah, Oppenheimer did say, if we go ahead and do this, the Soviet Union will believe it has no choice but to pursue these weapons themselves. I mean, they all understood that there's no way to uncreate this or put it back in the bottle, if you want to use that cliche. But, you know, you can probably tell from my questions here that I think some of the anti-communism was paranoid or unhinged. But at the same time, the Soviet Union was not a good faith partner in a lot of these endeavors. Indeed. <laughs> you know, one, one thing that is often forgotten, and I don't know if it's in Marty and Kai's book or not, is that in April 1945, many weeks before the bomb is actually tested, before we know it works, uh, Henry Stimson, who was the Secretary of War, briefed Harry Truman, who had just become president after FDR's death, and basically told Truman what he, Stimson, had heard from the scientists. And he says to Truman, 
other nations, even smaller nations, will develop this bomb in time. The Russians will probably get it first, of course. But eventually, even groups will have this. Even groups. So Truman was told early on, before the bomb even was tested, that this weapon is going to proliferate. This is this is not the end of it. And we're not going to drop one on Japan and then be done with it. That these weapons are going to be around and they're going to be around in massive numbers. And ultimately, people who we, we would never trust are going to have them. So it is kind of a tragedy that nothing was done. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, Oppenheimer did not want the U.S. to unilaterally disarm. He believed it had to happen through dialogue with other countries, namely the Soviet Union. You know, it takes a few decades. We actually do get to that. We're Ronald Reagan, and I think this is Reagan's most important contribution, is de-escalating the Cold War and finally sitting down with his Soviet counterpart, and much of the credit goes to Gorbachev as well, to do something about these horrible weapons. Reagan truly despised nuclear weapons in a way that maybe past presidents should have despised them, or maybe they did, but they felt they were under so much pressure they couldn't do anything but keep adding to them. But we finally do get there, is my point. But, you know, we're going in the opposite direction in the last few decades. There are really no limitations now. This is not so much a question, Greg, as a a word salad, but maybe it's a good place to wrap up. You know, we're not going in that direction anymore. We're seeing proliferation. Uh, you know, the irony is that even though we the Cold War is over, if it's Cold War one, 1.0, that the likelihood of a, of a nuclear weapon being used, I think, is greater now than ever before. Not necessarily a uh, what Herman Kahn called a spasm war, you know, an unlimited exchange of nuclear weapons, but it possibly a terrorist bomb or a demonstration. Some colleagues and I at the Livermore Lab uh, and the Monterey Institute wrote a piece for Politico, how Putin might use a tactical nuclear weapon as a demonstration, simply to cross the nuclear threshold. There has been this threshold, this allergy since 1945, to send a message that it could be a small weapon, it could be just exploded in space for that matter, but it crosses the threshold and it shows, okay, that threshold is is over and that I'm a dangerous guy and God knows what I might do next. An atomic bomb is not a new conception, a new discovery of reality. It is a very ordinary thing in some ways compact with much of the science that makes our laboratories and our industry. But it will change men's lives as over the centuries the knowledge of the solar system has changed them. For in a world of atomic weapons, wars will cease. And that is not a small thing, not small in itself, as the world knows today perhaps more bitterly than ever before, but perhaps in the end even greater in the alterations, the radical if slow alterations, in the relations between men and between nations and cultures that it implies. It can only help us, I believe, to recognize these issues as rather great issues. We can serve neither ourselves nor the cause of the freedom and growth of science nor our fellow men if we underestimate the difficulties or if we through cowardice becloud the radical character of the conflict and its issue. During our lifetime, perhaps, atomic weapons could be either a great or a small trouble. They cannot be a small hope. They can be a great one. We're indebted to Joe Cerincioni, David M. Kennedy, and Greg Herkin for being my guests in this three-part series about Oppenheimer and the historical debates raised by this great movie. Go to historyasithappens.com and sign up for my newsletter. Every Friday morning, you'll get an email from The Washington Times with my thoughts on the previous week's episodes and a preview of what's coming up next. That's at historyasithappens.com.